This is episode 72 with Kate Peterson, and her topic is very unusual, which is what does a yoga teacher in Australia in 2018 look like? We're going to talk about country and how yoga fits in with that concept. Let's listen. I also have an opportunity for you. Hersha Yoga is offering an online course to teach you or expand your knowledge in the area of accessible yoga for pregnant women. And it is available now, and you can sign up at http colon double forward slash bit dot ly forward slash Hersha, and that's H-E-R-S-H-A, all caps. And if you put in this code when you are paying for the course, you will receive 15% off. So the code is C-F-O-Y-H-E-R-S-H-A, again, all caps. So that may be an opportunity for those of you that want to learn or to expand your knowledge about providing accessible yoga for pregnant women. Hello, and welcome to Change the Face of Yoga, teaching toddlers through golden oldies. I'm very excited to be talking to lots of yoga teachers who will explain their passion for teaching yoga to students with different ages, physical fitness levels, wellness levels, and different goals. They will explain the benefits of yoga for these students, and will be including teacher tips and pose modifications. I am Stephanie Cunningham of Yoga Lightness, and I've been teaching over 50s for 10 years. So this area is my passion and the passion of many other yoga teachers that you will be listening to in this series. Thank you so much for listening, and let's get started. This is Stephanie Cunningham with Changing the Face of Yoga, and I have a very interesting guest today. It's Kate Peterson, and Kate is kind of amazing, to be honest. (laughs) She believes in the efficacy of yoga practice to bring about positive social change. And to that goal, she has been involved in a multitude of things, all with the purpose of that positive social change. And some of those things are yoga path, get off your asana, yoga hive, healthy results, and off the mat into the world. And we're not going to talk about any of those. We're going to talk about her brand new project, which is what does it look like to be an Australian yoga teacher in 2018? Welcome, Kate. And is there anything else that you would like to talk about? Oh, I could talk forever about all of those, (laughs) but I'm not going to do so. (laughs) And I think that the way that I see all those things you've listed is that they're purely vehicles for bringing about social change. And that question that we're posing of what does it look like to be a yoga teacher in Australia in 2018 is um, uses those vehicles to ask that question. So I shall explain. (laughs) Okay. How are you thinking about what it is to be an Australian yoga teacher? I mean, obviously there's lots of media out there that might show one kind of a yoga teacher. There's uh, a lot of yoga therapists. There's a lot of different ways that you could be a yoga teacher. What's your thinking on it? Well, I guess, you know, there's a difference in the question, what does it look like to be a yoga teacher in 2018, as opposed to what does it look like to be an Australian yoga teacher in 2018? Mm -hmm. And we're particularly asking that question because that's the the pool of yoga that I'm swimming in and um, all my colleagues over here in Australia. Whilst it might have a lot of relevance, the answer to that question for other countries, we're particularly asking it here because we're in a very fortunate circumstance and over here in Australia we have the oldest living continuous culture in the planet who have been custodians of this land for well they're saying 68,000 sciences showed definitely but probably much much longer they've been here looking after the land and practicing what it is to be a human so the reason that we're asking that question about what does it look like to be a yoga teacher 
in Australia in 2018 is to really examine what can we draw from this culture, this ancient culture and this very modern culture, you know, it's continual. What kind of learnings can we draw for our yoga practice? Mm. And do we, have you gotten any answers to that question yet? So many. (laughs) (laughs) Good. (laughs) I think, um, you know, it's a question that's been uh, bandied around for a few years in our community. And we've started by putting a toe in the water. So as Get Off Your Asana and Off the Mat Into the World and also Yoga Australia, in addition to IYTA, um, are the four bodies that have been championing this, this question. We've been handing around this postcard, which basically asks all yoga teachers across Australia to start their class by acknowledging country. And that is something that is quite a standard practice these days for any public gathering in Australia. And it means paying respect to the country on which you find yourself and custodians who've been looking after that country in the past and and in the present and in the future. So, you know, that's something that I, I believe, and I'm not sure... It's absolutely true, but isn't really practiced in many other countries besides Hawaii and New Zealand I've heard of, but I'm not sure that it's widely practiced in the States. So it's a practice that really helps people ground themselves before their physical practice of asana. It's very much about coming into the room and coming into the place of being. And it connects us to the deeper spirit of, of the land and the deeper spirit here. So anyway, that postcard's done the rounds. There's maybe been 2,000 of those postcards handed around our community, including as time went by, we've handed them to Anna Forrest, who many yoga practitioners will be familiar with, and also Shiva Ray, who now tell me that they acknowledge country wherever they are in the world. So that's Mm. exciting. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, that was kind of the ground that we started with. And now um, we've, we're working very strongly alongside Yoga Australia to bring about something called a reconciliation action plan, which is about really working on the relationship between yogis across this country and elders in all the 250 plus Aboriginal countries that are embodied within the land of Australia. Mm. So... Yes. It's a big picture thing. <laughs> it is. We talked previously and you said that there are some Aboriginal yoga teachers and yet their practice, their teaching may be different because yeah. of the culture they come from. And what can we learn about that from that? Right. Well, I think, um, you know, firstly, as a yoga teacher, you and I and everybody else out there, <laughs> <laughs> um, all our practices are different, right? So we, you very much learn a discipline, you follow a lineage, and then you present yoga in the way that it appears to be the truth to you. So, of course, that's going to be individually different. So it's hard to speak in, I can speak in very broad brushstrokes. So let's try. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So, there's a, so there's about I am aware, personally aware, of nine yoga teachers across Australia who also have Aboriginal background. I'm sure there's plenty more, you know, like uh, it's not just because I'm aware of nine, there is nine. I think there's probably probably 900. <laughs> but anyway, having talked to these particular teachers, they, they're they very clear that a lot of the precepts and the practices of yoga are things that they have been exposed to or learnt traditionally with different flavours, with different presentations. And they are also very clear that it needs, that the way that they teach yoga has to be tailored quite differently within their communities. So let's just go into that. (laughs) You know, Australia's been colonised now for 200 and I don't know, it's like, let's say 230, 40 years. It was a very violent colonisation as colonisation was in many places. And it was very, very disruptive. So there was a lot of effort put in by the colonisers to destroy the culture that they found themselves in and um, and the communities that they found themselves in. And we, we're all pretty familiar with the horror of that, so we don't need to go there. But a lot of the, the culture went underground, as it does in many countries, because it has to. And that culture is still incredibly strong and incredibly important, and it's a bedrock for Aboriginal community throughout the country. So there's a lot of practices within Aboriginal communities that are really 
and tick the same goals that we as yogis have. So I'm going to ask you a question, Stephanie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm getting too bored with my voice. What after, you know, what if somebody said to you, what are you trying to achieve as a yoga teacher? What is that? I tend to teach seniors. So I'm trying to achieve certain things to maintain their independence and mobility, both mentally and physically. Mm, that's a good answer. <laughs> so, yeah, right. So in keeping your independence and mobility, and I guess also there a really big precursor of that is also your motivation, right? Because without sure. that motivation, it's hard to find the energy to be <laughs> to keep yourself healthy like that keeping yourself healthy really demands I think a sense of purpose for being in the world right so mm -hmm. it's like well why am I keeping myself healthy and therefore you've got that kind of goalpost um so aboriginal culture of course they had so many practices like all humans all around the world to keep yourself healthy a lot of those were about connecting to country so that involved a lot of dance and a lot of ritual movement that helped the body stay really really in peak condition because over here it's a pretty harsh landscape and you needed to be very physically fit to walk the distances that aboriginal people did and to live be live in the way that they did so uh, health was fundamental. So nutrition, like balanced diet, is, was fundamental also. Coming together in community and raising your voice in song was like a, the basic way that Aboriginal people related to other Aboriginal people. So I'm just kind of ticking these off as things that yoga are also quite attracted to ascetic practices like fasting and um, pushing the body to its limits also a really big part of aboriginal culture so these things and practice of oneness the real understanding that we are all one and that we all come from the same source and that all this all this uh maya mm -hmm. <laughs> or illusion that we live in is really about transitory but is expressed expressing the same fundamental truth so that i've really rarely hung up with yogis that have the same depth of understanding as my Aboriginal friends in that respect. So yeah, there's all these things. Dadiri is a practice that is practiced in, in all countries, but Dadiri is a central desert word for mindfulness. And that was the practice of coming into the present moment and basically meditating, which um, has, is spreading like wildfire at the moment around Australia in communities. So what I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot that we can learn from and draw on and in, not with permission, with full permission, incorporate into our yoga practice in this country. I'm not talking about cultural appropriation. That's a big <laughs> word for, uh, for our yoga community now. And I, I imagine that quite a few people who are listening have been also really aware of that cultural appropriation argument that's happening are you aware of that, Stephanie? I, I am, but I think it might be, could you just give a short uh, sure. little discussion about it in case some of the listeners are not aware of it so that we at least are all starting from the same place? Totally. And I think that, yeah, so cultural appropriation in the way that I understand it is, is a question mark that has been posed um, firstly in Canada and then in the States and also here. So it's about... Can, you know, is it okay for us to be practicing another culture's spiritual practice? So in the case of yoga, that would be India's cultural practice. And, you know, is, is it okay to use the symbols and the, and the signs and the statues and the techniques of a different culture out of context? And it's... Um, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a really, really interesting question because I think it's a very, there's a lot of answers to that and it's quite a confused field. So the way that we understand it is that yoga has been around for, you know, maybe 4,000 in 3,000 in a written form, 6,000 in a non-written form in India, um, and that we've been lucky enough to draw from that well of knowledge about being a human and and present our yoga to our students. So that's all great, but is, um, are we paying due respect to the culture that, from which it came? And because, so there's that question, but it's a very, um, you know, like yoga is an evolutionary discipline. And it, as Krishnamacharya said, you know, it's really an evolutionary 
discipline that keeps changing according to the needs that present themselves. So those needs are very different in the US in 2018 than they were in India in 1834, you know. So its face has changed a lot. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, oh, it <laughs> continues to. I mean, what's the name of your podcast? Changing, Changing the face, face of yoga. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Hello. So, you know, like it's um it's how do we make that how does that yoga become the most appropriate it can be to the situation it finds itself in? So cultural appropriation is, you know, are we doing this in a respectful way? Are we moving ahead in a way that the forefathers of yoga would have been proud of? And that gets quite heated. It really, really does. There's some, some interesting, if people go to the Facebook, get off your asana, the Australian Facebook, get off your asana, then you'll see a late, a post which is from a guy that's just done a really interesting, he's from India, but his parents were from India, but he was born in New York. And he's just done this, made this fantastic collage of all these images of yoga being practiced in the States back to, you know, the 1930s, 1940s. And he's asking cultural appropriation. So that exhibition's hanging at the moment in San Francisco. And I wish I was there to have a look. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, changing face of yoga, cultural appropriation, big questions, et cetera, et cetera. And I, um, I feel like one of the ways that yoga is changing its face is what we're speaking to with the name of what we're doing here, which is getoffyourasana.com.au. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we hear people my age, 54, are often talking, yoga teachers our age, are often talking about like, wow, look what's happening to yoga. There seems to be everybody in a bikini on a rock on Instagram. And that's what people think of as yoga. And it's um, so getting off your asana and coming back to the more traditional roots of yoga is probably important so that yoga can do its work in this world. Let me try to get a question that would meld these two ideas together, which is what is it like to be an Australian yoga teacher in 2018 and being aware that you are in a different country, that you have a very long tradition in this country of many of the same precepts as yoga. And then on the other hand, all of us seem to be have come from our lineages, our Indian. So how are we going to put those together? Are, or are we not? Well, good question. I don't, I'm not sure myself, but I think that the conversation needs to be opened. And all I see it right now is as a conversation. So Yoga Australia is spearheading the opening of that conversation across the country. So, you know, with full respect to everything that we've learned from India, there's equal kind of practice going on in this country. And so, you know, like I um, am very, I, I think that currently we are up in our yogic um, culture, we're up to 19 lineages in the court system for sexual abuse cases. Like, hello, it's, there's something really wrong with that. And times are changing. So I think that the traditional mode of yoga where there is a guru and that guru is the shepherd, I guess, of all of the people who follow the guru has to be questioned at this point in our history. So there may be safe ways and I'm, there's a lot of gurus who aren't in court, might I add, but there are a lot of gurus who are in court. So that whole pointy-ended hierarchy that is very much part of our traditional yoga culture, traditional Indian culture, and our traditional Western culture in terms of prime minister, headmaster, priest, etc., you know, which again, that whole, um, what do they say, power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts ultimately. Um, we have to start to question that basic model, that really basic model. So uh, I, I'm just posing the question. I don't have answers for this, but I think that we need to really look at that, right? Because if we continue to follow that same model, we create more opportunities for more people to rise to the top of the pile. And if we believe that power corrupts, then that can happen again and again. And Lord knows there's a lot of particularly women, but also men who've been very badly affected by the sexual deviation or power taking by those at the top. So this is, <laughs> this is part of the rich question that we're asking here is like, what is an appropriate model for teaching? You know, what is an appropriate model for passing on of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Let me swing it back to where we are in Australia and say, 
that in the Aboriginal culture, this doesn't, again, I'm sure that sexual deviation happens, you know, it does because we're human, right? But right. that, um, and power control in an inappropriate manner might also happen because again we're we're really susceptible to um, having too much power but the way traditionally that it worked here was that people would be given a piece of the puzzle so they would be responsible for one aspect of the functioning of the country on which they were were living so they might be representing and like literally being an advocate for a particular type of tree a particular waterway a particular land point a particular animal the more the more wise they were and the older they were, um, more responsibility of other people within that family grouping and beyond that family grouping to kind of argue the argument and, and, um, and discuss how to best look after the land according, from the eyes of an echidna, from the eyes of a casuarina tree, from the eyes of a coaster, whatever it was. So it was like a puzzle in which people had specific knowledge and power, which was passed down verbally for tens of thousands. Um, it was no one person rose to the top. I'm just, to, it's a very, very big picture kind of, I think, you know, the way that we think really re-examined um, in that respect. Just say one more thing on that, which is yoga, in my humble opinion, is about regaining the handlebars of our own mental and physical and spiritual well-being so needs to be able to feel like they of whom who they are and so look i'm just talking in very very broad brush strokes which is that there's stuff to learn from a culture and to think about in terms of looking at where yoga goes in Done. I could go on and on. <laughs> okay, so I understand the precepts and the concept of what you and Yoga Australia are giving out to the community at this point in time. What is is the ultimate goal? Just a discussion, to, uh, uh, an enlightenment, shall we say? That you know, this is an idea, or is there something a little more concrete that you are kind of working towards? Yes. Totally. I think there's a really tangible goal post here, which is um, to develop a different mode of inquiry. So there's a lot of opportunities being opened right now for yoga teachers throughout Australia to um, be on country, so to walk with the elders in this land and actually feel like, feel what it is to be here and to draw that knowledge into themselves and therefore into their practice and therefore into their teaching. So we're opening up opportunities for cultural competency training, which is getting across the precepts of Aboriginal culture and how that all works. Can you talk a little bit more about, okay, you talked about be on country and to get cultural competency. And then what you're working on is? Or, or asking for interest. So far, Stephanie, there are so many yoga teachers who are country. So we've had ridiculous amount of interest at the moment so that's very exciting but a lot of those yoga studios we're asking to do a NADOC event next week which is the National Australian Indigenous remember what that stands for yeah I <laughs> but, know um, what you mean I was thinking yeah. of that too uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so we're asking them to the studios to run a NADOC event where where they're inviting Aboriginal elders to come to sit with them and tell story and welcome to country and basically starting to open the doorways to conversation. So there'll be a lot out there. If you happen to be a yogi in Australia, you'll see things happening through Yoga Australia, through Get Off Your Asana, through IYTA, through a number of different yoga channels. Those conversations are going to be in the public. How will you know? that this conversation has occurred and that there's been some good benefits? That's a great question <laughs> because we're working, we're not just going out there and doing this thing, thing. we're very beautifully mapped out template which is if anybody wants to check it out it's on reconciliation australia and it's called the reconciliation action plan. So this is an aboriginal or Prime Minister's office and what you do is submit the first part of that which is a one-year process called the Reflect Reconciliation Action Plan and it may cut, go through four or five iterations until Reconciliation Australia feels that you've totally tackled all the questions and got the most out of it and then it's accepted and um, endorsed and so then we move on to the Innovate 
reconciliation action plan, which can last for two to three years where things reach their full fruition. But all of it needs to be documented and actually tested and researched as to how far it reaches. And then from there, you move into the Elevate Reconciliation Action Plan, which is basically being a role model for other organizations like your own and and further developing what what you've started. And then there's another level, again, I can't remember. This is the joy of being 54, hey? (laughs) (laughs) Or the joy of bureaucracy, one is the other. (laughs) Anyway. So I'm really excited about working with them because it's the most organized organization you I've come across for ages. (laughs) (laughs) And that is nice. I agree. You're actually going to go through a very long, very detailed uh, process that would bring, I assume it's Yoga Australia, IAYT, Get Off Your Ass and all of that, all that, that group together to give all of these tools and education and information to the yoga teachers in Australia about country and how to, and and are you looking at how to integrate it into their yoga teaching or their yoga practice? Yeah, very well, you know, again, this has to be done with strict permission. So we are not into the cultural appropriation part of this. So it's so (laughs) so so important that we make sure that anything any tool that that people are privy to aboriginal um technology for want of a better word is given permission that the teacher is given permission to utilize that so that can only happen on a one-to-one basis so it's Mm. certainly there's not going to be a 200 hour training in how to be an aboriginal yoga teacher train trainer you know like (laughs) that can't happen so it's really a different model a really different model than than the one we're used to yeah, very different. And I don't see it as replacing what we're currently doing. I see it as as an adjunct, as something that allows us to pay absolute respect to the elders in this country and open up pathways of listening. So that's how I see it. Okay. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. Really. I'm, I, I'm from the United States. I'm sure you can tell from my accent because everybody else can. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think I found Australian and I don't, so. (laughs) But I just, I'm always amazed at how Australians come at problems. It's so very Mm -hmm. different than the way we do it, did it in the United States. haven't been there for 18 years, so. (laughs) And I just, I really love this idea of it is a one-on-one, that there's a relationship built before you try to bring in country into your to your yoga in whatever way is comfortable for you but i just i just love the way that people go about it here in australia that it's a very non-dominant shall we say kind of way of doing things just it's it's a group it's a community thanks for pointing that out i really love love that you said that and i i think also you know it really just cut, does in some ways hark back to how yoga used to be taught back in india in the day right so people would set off and they'd go on a yoga journey and they'd find their guru and then they would sit with their guru and they might be given, you know, asked to clean the ashram for the first two years and then given a few asana and then gently introduced to pranayama, etc. So it, it was given to you as you were ready to learn. Mm-hmm. And um, that meant that the elders had to really hold it and understand that. So we've, we were in a very different stage of yoga teaching in this country. And, um, and I, I'm not saying we should go back to entirely like that, but I think that that can be a component part that, you know, it becomes incredibly special to have somebody who you can relate to when you've got the deeper spiritual questions come up as a yoga teacher. It's, it's something that perhaps most yoga teachers crave to have those questions examined, to start to think deeply into the nature of existence. It's um, part of yoga. What kind of contact details would you like to give the listeners so that they can uh, participate in this question of what's it like to be an Australian yoga teacher in 2018? Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, Get Off Your Asana is supporting Yoga Australia in spearheading this action. So I'm going to give you an email, which would be great. So that email is act, A-C-T, act, Mm -hmm. at getoffyourasana.com.au. 
And I, you know, I love to talk about this stuff. Can you tell? <laughs> yes, yes, so, I can. <laughs> and I'm really glad too. <laughs> it makes a good podcast. <laughs> so people, you can either, if you'd like to know more about this, uh, you can go to act, A-C-T, at getoffyourasana.com.au. Or you can talk directly to Kate, which is a very generous offer. And her number is 0419609991. So thank you, Kate. I really, this has been such a fascinating idea. I really had never even, I'll be honest, even thought of it. <laughs> so this is a great thing to, to learn about. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the uh, podcast. It's, uh, it was a good, a good conversation. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I really, really appreciate it. I was thinking of there's one other way that you can participate, but not until next week. Oh, <laughs> and we'll it be won't, writing. It won't be on next week. So if you want to say that, that's okay. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So there's a fantastic crowdfunding platform called Start Some Good, and we'll be on there with a a crowdfunding campaign, which of course is very much not only about gathering money to make sure that this has some legs but also gathering people's interest and it's going to be called how do you say yoga in yongu yongu being a traditional language and how do you spell yongu y-o-l-n-j-u in in j-u okay <laughs> how do you say yoga okay great n-g-u not j n-g-u in okay, Y O N. So Y O L. Y O L. Ah, in, in G U. Ah, oh, I've seen that. Okay, good. I just didn't know how to say it. <laughs> all right. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll I will get all of those out into the show notes, and so okay. that people can can um, contact you in any way that's best for them. So thanks again, Kate. It was a great podcast. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Much appreciated. Take okay. care. Thank you for that wonderful interview. If you would like to be a guest on Changing the Face of Yoga, please go to my website, www.yogalightness.com.au and under the Changing the Face of Yoga tab, you can complete Be Our Guest form. After reviewing the form and finding it applicable to this podcast, we will send you a link to schedule an interview. Please download, review, and tell your friends of any podcasts that are of interest to you and to them. If you would like to contact me, send an email to info at yogalightness.com.au. And thank you for listening to Changing the Face of Yoga.